welcome to Themis Podcasts. Themis is a risk management firm specialising in financial crime. Our aim of these podcasts is to bring you interesting news, interviews and recordings of our exclusive events from the world of financial crime. Financing of Terrorism the role of ISIS and modern slavery and human trafficking. This is the second in a series of two podcasts this summer on the financing of terrorism. Very Chon talks to Professor Nick Ryder on specific terrorist threats from ISIS and how this has evolved to the connections with modern slavery and human trafficking. Developments in the regulatory landscape for terrorist financing are discussed and examples of best practice in the UK such as the work done by Jimlet, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, is discussed. Practical recommendations are also provided to help organisations keep up with emerging threats. Welcome to this podcast on terrorist financing. This is the second of a series where I have Professor Nick Ryder with me, who's an expert and leader in terrorist financing. Um, I'm Viri Chauhan and I'm the MD for Themis Community and in this second podcast we're going to be talking to uh, Nick uh, to go into a little bit more detail on terrorist financing and to sort of look at the changing nature of this subject. So first of all uh, Nick I'd like to welcome you back and thank you for joining us again. Thanks Viri. Um, Nick, in your last uh, podcast, you talked a lot uh, about using different sources of material, and I know that you've written wild, wild, wildly, uh, widely, excuse me, on the subject of terrorist financing, and published books and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, articles. Um, but could you start off by telling us some of the work you may have done? Uh, wider in the field with either agencies or with uh, private organisations that you can share with us for our listeners in some of the projects you've uh, been working on? Yeah, um, I, I suppose I started researching terrorism financing in 2006 to 2007 and that's when my, my first paper was published. Uh, in terms of funded projects, um, we, we've been involved with a number of uh, re- successful research grants over the years. Um, from a counter-terrorism financing point of view, um, I was privileged enough to be uh, part of a uh, collaborative project that was called CREST, uh, the Centre for Research into Evidence and Security Threats with Lancaster University, Birmingham, Portsmouth and Bath University. And that was a three-year funded project by the ESRC. And for that project, uh, we were involved in uh, looking at counter-terrorism financing measures and were able to produce a, uh, a detailed paper that looked at the effectiveness of the financial war on terrorism and how that uh, attempted to limit the finances of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levante. That project expired in 2018. Uh, currently, uh, as I mentioned to you in the previous podcast, I've been involved in writing two detailed papers on the association between terrorism financing and crypto assets. And the most recent paper, which I've been working on this morning, uh, is on the sort of terrorism financing uh, fraud typology. Uh, We're working with a company uh, in Gloucester called Synologic. Uh, We've just been awarded um, an amount of money for a a counter-terrorism financing project uh, with them. So it's, and we've been, I suppose, other things I've been involved in. We've done some training for NATO, CEPOL, um, main UK financial services providers on perceived threats posed by money laundering. So it's it's been, um, in many cases, uh, quite a privilege to work with some very interesting people and to deliver yeah. the, the research findings but actually to make an impact as well. It's not necessarily sitting in an ivory tower writing a theoretical paper on counter-terrorism finance and how the laws work. They, they, they actually, you know, we've been fortunate to get some evidence from companies that the feedback and a research makes a difference to them and, and helps them tackle terrorism finance. So, for example, one law enforcement entity 
um, after looking at the findings of a, a project we published last year, have now changed how they investigate counterterrorism financing cases in Europe. So, you know, that, that, that to me is an added bonus in terms of if the research can make uh, a positive impact on society or from a law enforcement perspective. That, that's, that's just great. So, that's really great. So you've got quite a wide exposure, uh, which is good, which I want to go into uh, later in, the, in this podcast. You mentioned uh, some of the research that you've done with ISIS and ISIL. So could we talk about that first of all? Can, can you start off by explaining what ISIS is and ISIL, yeah. if there's a difference, and then we'll go a little bit more deeper. Yeah, uh, it's it's the same terrorist organization. It just depends what report you read, uh, ISIS, I, ISIL, Daesh, as some people will call it. Um, ISIS is an unprecedented terrorist group. Um, what we discovered with the, the 2018 paper, which I'm very happy to send you, very and please feel free to serve it to your members if you'd like a copy, that's absolutely fine. Okay. What we found is that ISIS, its funding model is what we call hierarchical of corporate. That means it's funded like a company. So it's unprecedented. Um, ISIS had its own currency. ISIS adapted and learned from the mistakes made by Al-Qaeda in terms of its funding models. So, for example, uh, Al-Qaeda's access to finances were limited after the financial war on terrorism, especially from within the sanctions regime. But because ISIS controlled at the time the caliphate, such a broad area of land, they were able to, I think, exploit social media platforms more. Uh, ISIS published their own annual report, their own annual budget, and according to some secondary sources, they had a larger GDP than, for example, Western Samoa. So you can see that from a, a law enforcement a, or a intelligence services point of view, ISIS was unprecedented. We've never seen this before. But it's intriguing that the more you look into how ISIS is financed, how similar they're financed to the IRA. So the IRA had a corporate funding model with accountants, and of course they paid their employees, which is how ISIS were partly financed. They would actually pay their terrorists and pay families of suicide bombers a compensation fee. So ISIS really was unprecedented in relation to the height of the caliphate. And they were able to, and again, according to secondary sources such as the US Treasury Department, at the height of the caliphate, that they were selling oil for $1.5 million a day. Now, I can't corroborate those figures, and they might, they might be a guess with the best, but if you take that over a year, that's half a billion dollars. So that fuel would have been um, smuggled out of uh, northern Iraq, northern Syria, maybe into other Middle Eastern countries. We don't particularly know. But if those figures are accurate, then ISIS still has access to a large sum of money. The question is, where is the money and how they transferred it out of the region? So I think it, it, you know, it is a significant threat. Um, I discussed in the first uh, podcast, Barry, that there are several um, terrorism finance and convictions in America that link into ISIS. So it would be intriguing to see if there is you know, a, a more and more frequent attacks post lockdown, uh, sure. how, those, how those attacks can possibly be financed. Okay, so in, 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 in terms of ISIS and the current times, are we seeing a, a pause in activity or has there been <clears throat> events that have created uh, some sort of stagnation? Um, I think we've seen the uh, the ground forces in terms of the attacks, uh, Western forces, the Russians and the Syrians against ISIS in, in what was the caliphate. So I think that has had an impact. But what we have seen in, in Europe and across the world in the past decade with, with the, the increased activity of ISIS is how they're, they're moving away from highly sophisticated and highly funded acts of terrorism 
towards lone wolf terrorists and towards um, terrorist attacks which are committed by basic illegal activities like fraud, for example. And so you, you look at the San Bernardino terrorist attack in America, in California, a few years back, and how that was financed via a payday loan company of $28,000. You look at how the 7th of July tax in London were partly financed through one of the terrorists maxing out their credit cards and using a personal loan. So what we found recently, and this is the conclusion of the paper, is that a lot of the recent terror attacks are very low cost and low caliber weapons, such as a car, truck, or as in many cases, a knife and a machete, which you can buy from any grocery store for 10, 15, 20 pounds. So that's yeah. what we call sort of microfinance terrorism or, or low cost terrorism, which makes it very difficult to prevent. Of course, and, uh, and I suppose, um in the first uh, podcast, we talked about the the model being used uh, of of late was the model that was applied to money laundering. But if you're talking about low levels of finance involved, those aren't going to actually get the the red flags that would indicate um, a potential uh, risk for terrorist financing. So. You know what? What is the sort of answer for organisations where they all of these types of financial transactions won't actually be be noticed? Mm. Uh, that 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 is the key question. Uh, I, I and this I think comes back to how the international community and, and domestic governments tackle terrorism financing. I think that two things really. Firstly, as I mentioned in the first podcast, the Money laundering profit reporting model, I don't think is fit for purpose to tackle terrorism financing. And secondly, and this is what the, the new paper, uh, some of the findings and conclusions are. What we found in America is that the FBI and Department of Justice actively use a fraud investigation as a disruptive mechanism. So that means, for example, that they will arrest and charge suspected terrorists on accusations of fraud. So the Americans have used uh, the wire fraud statute, the mail fraud statute and others to disrupt terrorist activities. Now, conversely, the UK appears not to be doing that. So for example, if we look at the, the London Burr market attacks and other attacks in London uh, three years ago, especially in Kareem Butt, one of the, the terrorists, Queen, uh, but according to the official inquiry into the terror attacks in London, was actually arrested for fraud in 2016. But he was not prosecuted. So if the model would have been used whereby you disrupt a terrorist group by using a more detailed and up-to-date fraud typology, which is what our research at UE concludes, possibly that might have prevented the terrorist attack. Now, the reasons given for dropping the prosecution are redacted, so clearly that they're going to be bound by the Official Secrets Act legislation, but it's just another example of where the um, financial activities of terrorists forms a pattern. It forms a pattern of illegal activity. It forms a pattern of low-level fraud. So the fraud typology that we're advocating to be used includes insurance fraud, personal loan fraud, credit card fraud. So it's, to me, it's very important to look at low level fraud and to try to use that as a disruptive mechanism to prevent acts of terrorism. And the Americans appear to be very successful at using that. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's useful uh, and interesting. Um, I want to stay on the subject of of ISIS um, and <clears throat> sort of moving to the area other other financial crime areas. Do you, do you think that there's any um, links with modern slavery and human trafficking and financing of terrorism? Uh, yes, uh, if you look at the um, <clears throat> the 2018 paper that we wrote on how ISIS financed the uh, 
ISIS uh, were heavily involved in a broad range of illegal activities. And I have no doubt that that will include modern slavery and human trafficking. Uh, as we've seen with the, the Arab Spring two years ago and the, the terrible and very sad stories of people attempting to leave the Middle East, North African states and so on, to drink it into Europe. We've seen that they're paying thousands of pounds to people to be trafficked uh, into Europe to uh, whether that be low level paying jobs or for a better life for their families. So I've no doubt that you know ISIS will be involved in human trafficking. They, they did control a large part of North uh, Iraq and Syria. So it's likely that they would have um, kidnapped a little bit like Boko Haram in uh, in America uh, in Africa, sorry, with the kidnapping of, of the school children several years ago. So absolutely, you know, it, it's a uh, kidnap for ransom is a very popular method of financing with Al Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, and ISIS. Yeah. So it sounds like <clears throat> with uh, financing of terrorism, it does fit in and relate to other financial crimes. So for organizations, I suppose you can't isolate these in silos. You do need to look at them, look at them as a whole. OK, what about um, any sort of regulatory developments that we may need to be aware of either on the international scale or the domestic uh, level? Uh, yeah, I think the um, the most important uh, to your, your listeners will be uh, 5MLD, of course, to be incorporated in January 2020 this year. Um, probably your, uh, your members are very well aware of the obligations of the 5MLD and the extension to prepaid cards and crypto assets. But perhaps... Um, I think the most important development in terms of counter-terrorism financing um, was announced in 2015 by the then Home Secretary Theresa May, obviously the former Prime Minister, with the creation of Jimlet, which is the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force. And this applies to uh, what we classify as the voluntary exchange of information. So this information is provided in addition to uh, a suspicious activity report. So there is no prosecution for not providing the extra information to Jimlet. There's no sanction to be imposed. So what the, the the mechanism tries to do, very, is that it tries to create what's called a super SAR. I think is what the law commission referred to in his 2018 report. And. The results are excellent. Um, the London Borough market attack within 12 hours, they were able to identify the source of financing for the, the vehicle use, which I believe is unprecedented in terms of terrorism financing time frame. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and <coughs> sorry, very. Well, while you're having a while you uh, having a drink, Nick, I think. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Jimlet, and uh, you know we've been working with this uh, sort of consortium as well with our efforts on modern slavery and human trafficking. And uh, you know you mentioned the the super SARS, i.e. the the sort of the <clears throat> the coordinated uh, information between different financial institutions to to actually help. Uh, an investigation is seems c common sense to me. Yeah. So you, what you're saying is that that's been a, a, a success. Yeah, I think based upon the public information which is available um, on the HM Treasury website, uh, there have been numerous arrests for money laundering. Accounts have been frozen, assets have been frozen. <clears throat> but the the intriguing thing is that in the mutual evaluation report, um, FATF concluded that Jim that was best international practice. And they've encouraged other member states to adopt this. So I think Australia, Singapore, Thailand, and the US have a similar um, public private joined up approach. I'm not saying it's perfect because Jimla doesn't apply to law firms, state agents, um, crypto asset providers, social media platforms. And in the evidence given to the Law Commission, um, <clears throat> some law enforcement agencies were non-committal all were against extending the scope of Jimla, which I'm quite surprised at because if 
if it works and you, you bring more information to the table, surely you're going to end up with a, a more of a holistic understanding of how terrorism financing works or how human slavery, human trafficking works. Mm -hmm. So I think that Jim <clears throat> is a very good initiative, but I would like to see its, its remit and membership expanded to include other professions. So for example, law firms are highly at risk for money laundering, fraud, as are estate agents. But they appear to be not within the remit of of Jimla. Okay, so <clears throat> policy recommendation from you, which is really good uh, for, for the regulators and the governments, uh, which they should take uh, into account. Um, Nick, it's been really interesting talking to you. Um, we we talked a little bit about your some of your projects and some of your uh, work that you've been doing. Again, could I ask, um, in terms of our 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 listeners, what what in terms of the emerging areas of um, terrorist financing, what should we be focusing our attention on in terms of getting ready or doing some research on for our organisation? What would you advise? Um, again, I think it's very important to, to keep abreast of, of the, the typologies published by the Financial Action Task Force, but also to, to look at the emerging financing opportunities. Uh, I, I do think that um, fraud has become the, uh, the go-to or the safe funding mechanism. So I think it is important that corporations and your listeners sort of look at their counter fraud strategies, but link it into their terrorism financing strategies. Because what we're finding at a, at a UK central government level is that the, the counter fraud strategy and the CTF strategy are disconnected. Yes. They're looked at in isolation, and I think they have to be looked at as one. So I think it is important to look at, you know, what are your fraud mechanism reporting obligations? What are your counter fraud initiatives? And, and to keep abreast of any snippet of information that you can find as to how an attack is financed. And what we're finding is that there is a, an increased mixture of legitimate funds being used and leg illegitimate funds. So there's that sort of nexus between your, your terrorism financing and fraud. There is a clear connection there. So it's important to look for the fraud typologies and how they can be used then to prevent acts of terrorism as well. Okay, so a, a blended approach is required to take into account the wider the wider financial crimes, which makes absolute sense. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for uh, doing this podcast and obviously the previous one. We're indebted to you for your expertise in this area and uh, we really look forward to having you on again in the near future. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, very. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the latest Themis podcast. We hope you found it interesting and informative. If you would like to find out more about Themis, get in touch with us via our website, www.crime.financial. You can also subscribe for future news and interviews.